All right. Hello, everybody. I am Sam Ronsky. I am a regional cloud advocate for Microsoft working in San Francisco. Uh, and I am joined with by Jim Bennett, who is another cloud advocate here at Microsoft. And today we have one of the funnest streams I've gotten to do so far in this job. Uh, we're doing IoT pumpkins today, uh, sort, of, sort of to kind of do uh, get you into the Halloween spirit, hopefully. Um, so both Jim and I have already made uh, an IoT pumpkin. We're going to be kind of showing you what those are and kind of demoing what, what they do, and then also showing how you can make your own today. Um, so whether you want to write that in Python or .NET, we're going to be walking you through how to write, set up the code, get started, uh, and hopefully build something really cool today. Um, so Jim looks like he already has his pumpkin demo ready to go. Uh, so do you want to show us what you built? I do, yeah. And I'm going to have to take these goggles off because, oh, with these on, everything's <laughs> blue. It's very, very hard to see. I may look very cool, but uh, I can't see a thing. So, yes, this is this is my pumpkin. It's a, a lovely flickering pumpkin. Kind of looks nice and, uh, and scenic. Um, but this is actually, I've, I've got a few things going on with this pumpkin. I've got one version of this, which is internet powered. So I've got this connected to IoT. So if I go over to an IoT central application, um, I can change the color of my pumpkin. So if I if I want a nice a nice gentle say pink pumpkin, I can go into an IoT app, and then you see I've got a nice pink pumpkin. Or I can go back to flame setup and get nice sort of flames going. Or if it's not quite spooky enough, welcome to our fun house. <laughs> I can have the pumpkin scare you. Now, this is kind of a, an IoT one. This is where I can actually go onto a website and press buttons and control this. Kind of nice if you're watching trick or treaters come to your door and you want to you want you want to scare them. Or yeah, you know, if you think this pumpkin's too scary, change the color. Uh, I've also got one where I'm just going to have to kick off another quick demo briefly. I've got another one which is based off distance. So the pumpkin's not lit, but if I'm a trick or treater, I'm slowly walking up towards it. As I get closer, it lights up, it gets brighter, and then when I get too close... Welcome to our fun house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, I sound so creepy, don't I? But that, that, <laughs> that is my pumpkin. What about yours, Sam? Show me your pumpkin. Uh, so mine is uh, a pair of me. We both have a great smile. Uh, and uh, this one only has one eye, unfortunately. Uh, but... This is actually downloading an image from the internet or your local file system and actually using that to program the LEDs. So you can actually draw an image or find one online and use that to actually set the color of the LEDs over time. So you can basically sketch really cool animations however you'd like, just going that way. Uh, it makes it pretty fun. Um, nice. Yeah. So this is uh, built in .NET and using the uh, .NET IoT framework. Um, so it gives you a little bit of fun use there. You get to basically bring any .NET thing you want to IoT and build a pumpkin with it. So yeah, uh, yes. I think we're going to kick off and kind of show the wiring and then how to write a Python app to kind of get something like what Jim has uh, now. Yeah. <laughs> so. So let's you want to show us that? Let me just turn my lights back on so you can see. It's that, that, that nice, fun problem of when my pumpkin's lit up so you can see it has to be dark. But then as soon as I take it apart, you can't see anything. Uh, so I'm just going to do some dismantling. I'm going to hopefully not get a bit too gooey. Uh, so let me take my lid off. Now, yeah. Pump, pumpkin juice. So I've got my pumpkin here. I'm just going to turn it around. Slightly rotten pumpkin. Welcome Shush. To Shush. Um, <laughs> let me just stop that demo running so it doesn't keep popping up and doing that every five seconds because that's going to be very annoying. Ah, uh, control C is not working. Okay, so let me just take my thing out. So I've got my Raspberry Pi tucked inside the pumpkin and lots of cabling. Give me a second to unplug the cabling. Right. Now, first thing I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say is if you're putting anything with wires inside a pumpkin, a plastic bag could be your friend because we're dealing with electronics. Um, we're dealing with uh, you know, hardware. We're dealing with power. We're dealing with wet pumpkins. And electronics don't like wet things. So yeah, we need to make sure that if you're putting anything electronic inside a wet pumpkin, you have it protected. You don't want a short circuit going on. Uh, also, a top tip, if you're doing anything with a pumpkin with, with pies, you might need cables for power. So notice I've got a little cutout here that is to put the wires in. So, you know, when you're putting your pumpkin lid on, you don't have to have your pumpkin lid kind of at an odd angle. By having a hole for the wires, 
my lid can kind of sit on there. If I can get it lined up properly, it'll sit on there. Pro sit on there properly. Um, it's not quite lined up, is it? There we go. So they're probably, and I've got a hole for all my cables to go into. So top tip when carving pumpkins, have a hole for your power. So let's move the pumpkin out of the way for a second. Take everything out of the plastic bag. And what have we got here? Oh, my lights are up. Let me just adjust my camera so you can see this better. <laughs> Right, so I'm using a Raspberry Pi for this. So if anyone's ever seen any of my IoT streams, they probably know I'm a huge Raspberry Pi nut. I absolutely love Raspberry Pis. You know, I've got, as the second I saw that the Raspberry Pi Zero 02 was released yesterday, I ordered one. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a big <laughs> Raspberry Pi nut. So I've based it all around the Raspberry Pi. Um, because Raspberry Pi is a great board. If you've not used it, it's a Linux board. It's, uh, it's yeah, literally, it's quad-core processor. Mine's got four gigs of RAM. It's a four Linux operating system. So I can go cope with it. It's fantastic. And then what I've got plugged in here is I have uh, on top, this is a Grove Pi hat. So this is from a company called Seed Studios. And they do this really, really cool hardware for plugging in sensors. So I can put this on there, drop in cables, and attach sensors using just using these um, standard connectors. These are pretty cool. I don't have to worry about wiring too much resistors and stuff like that. I can just plug in sensors. So the distance sensor I've got, which we'll look at later, I just plug straight into that. So that's what this board on top is. And then I've got my lights plugged in. Now these lights, these are programmable LEDs. They are, and I can never remember the exact code number, WS8128B? Uh, 2812B. There you go, 2812B. I, I, I got my numbers wrong. So WS2812B. Um, so these are programmable LEDs. So the idea of these is you plug these in, and then you can actually individually address every single LED. So you can say light up this one, this one, this one, or what have you. And what's really cool is the first one to the one closest to your Pi is always zero. And then it goes up from there, which means you plug in any strip, and that one's zero. And the length, it doesn't matter. So you can have one, 10, 1,000, it doesn't matter. You just number them, zero up, upwards. And so if I put like five on here and I want to put more, I can just keep attaching. So literally keep sticking them on, make it as long as I need. So I can have a short number for a pumpkin and then run a whole stream up around my house and kind of light up everything else. And that's pretty cool. Now these, if I actually show you this, see this little, I don't know if you can see these gold, um, get close to the camera, these little bronze ovals. These are the solder points. So these, this line here is where you can cut it. So I can literally cut down here, chop off pixels. And then if I wanted to put more on, I could then just um, peel off the, the rubber coatings on the outside of this and solder those and attach more on. So I can use this to a whole lot of different lights, which is, which is pretty cool. Now, these are five volts power to run, to run these. So these run off five volts. And although your Raspberry Pi can give five volts, this is the electricity warning here. Folks, if you're gonna do anything with electricity, make sure you know what you're doing, you understand what you're doing, uh, yeah, read the guides, be safe. And because the main thing is you probably won't hurt yourself, but you might hurt your pie. So we need to look, look after all our goodies here. Uh, so with these, with the five volt power supply to these, one thing we need to make sure is we don't just draw five volts from the pie. So this is kind of one of Jim's top tips with these. If the pie can provide five volts power, if I do five volts straight into one of these with two or three pixels should be fine. If I put a 10 meter strip on there, the power draw might burn out the pie. So we don't want to put these straight to the pie. Instead, we want to power these by a separate power supply. And so the way these pixels work, is they, have, they have three inputs, red, green, and black. Red for power, green for control, black for ground. And so I need to connect both those to make, to make kind of two circuits. So what I've got, is I've got one circuit going here. So I've got a red and a black lead coming out of the end, end of the strip, end of the strip, it's got a connector on there, red and black, go into one of these terminal blocks, and this is my power supply. Now this one here is just plugged into a USB power supply, but you can get separate power supplies um, with the terminal blocks on here. Top tip, even a USB one, don't plug it into the Pi to power it from the Pi, it won't have enough power. So that one you wanna have plugged into the mains, and then you can run quite a lot of strips. I mean, if you, if you look at my camera, for example, let's see if I've got, got these purple lights behind me. This is one of these strips. It's got, I've got literally four, uh, one, two, three, four, 
five sets of these strips all running off a separate power supply. So if I connected this to Pi, my Pi would be on fire. My shelves would be on fire. It'll be a very bad thing. And I do not want my shelves on fire. Far too much good Lego on there. <laughs> um, so that gives me the power. That provides the power that runs the LEDs. Um, and then I just need, need that control circuit. I need something so I can program these LEDs. They're programmable. I need connected to Pi so I can program it. And so the way I do that is I connect it to the Pi's cables falling off. I connect to the Pi's GPIO pins. So these pins on the side of the Pi here, these are general purpose input output pins, GPIO, and these allow me to connect stuff. And so I connect a circuit to that. I've got a power one here, sorry, ground one connected to a ground pin, third pin along on the outside row is a ground pin, and that makes a circuit via a control wire. So the green one on here, I've got connected to a, another pin here, and that's the sixth pin along on the outside. That's actually pin number 18, because GPO pins are strangely numbered, but that gives me my control circuit. So I've got power to make the lights work and then a control circuit to actually allow me to program it. Now, quick note about the, the cables. So the cables I'm using for this, uh, you can obviously use any wires you like. If you want to get, get, get busy with soldering, go for it. Don't know about you, Sam, but uh, I don't solder. <laughs> no, I, I am awful, awful at soldering. <laughs> I have burnt so many fingers. I really have. Um, but the, so the cables you use, they, these are standard kind of jumper cables. Now, when I'm connecting from, say, here, the terminal block to the connection here, these are, if I just unplug one to show you, these have a pin on each end. So I've got a pin on this side, which plugs in there, and then a pin on that side that goes in this terminal block. So it's something like, let's bring my camera up a bit. So something like these, you, buy, you can buy these strips of jumper wires that have just goes pin to pin. You might see these referred to as male to male, um, but that terminology is being kind of phased out. So you should refer to as kind of pin to pin. Um, and then for the ones that connect the GPIO pins, because it's actually connected into a pin itself, then you get these pin to socket ones. And so the pin kind of goes into, into there and then the socket goes on the GPIO pin. Again, these used to be referred to as male to female, but that terminology is being, is being phased out. Now, the, the magic wiring, I have to say there is some magic wiring here. These particular LED strips, they have the extra power and ground wire, so I can do the ground to control circuit. These are just bare wires. And so I did the, the, uh, the magic wiring of taking the bare wire, twisting it around a pin and taping up with electrical tape. So that, awesome. that's my wiring for this. Sam, what about you? What... So mine looks a little bit different. Uh, I do, I have mostly the same thing, uh, just a little, hold on. My actual Pi is a little bit different. Uh, I am using SPI for communication. So I'm actually on a specific GPIO port in order to connect that, which is the 10th from the uh, top. I don't actually know how to map these, but uh, that's not helpful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, GPIO 10 is the port you need for .NET stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, just because it uses SPI instead of explicitly saying which GPIO port you're using. Um, so you actually need to map that pin there. Uh, and that will actually allow you to, to do all the communication. Other than that, it's all the same. Um, I actually, into those barrel sockets, I actually just ran the bare wires from the LED strip. Um, one call that I have there is to add tape around them because those wires are pretty flimsy. Um, and so it just prevents like any stress from pulling them out or or causing them to flex and break and do do anything weird. Uh, you can just kind of wrap some some electrical tape or something around there just to keep them from from shearing off and breaking and and not working anymore or just needing to to re re screw them back in. That's the typical typical failure case. I like your idea of of just using the uh, the pins directly into it. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Well, it's, it's one of the things you need, you just need to play with it. You need to kind of play with it, work out what you need, you know, get your electrical tape. Everybody needs electrical tape. Um, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's however you make it work. There's a whole lot of different types of these strips. Uh, I noticed, yeah, so we've, we've actually put a link in the chat to the particular ones we're using. Uh, but really, any WS2812B compatible LEDs you can kind of use for this. Now, you may hear these referred to as NeoPixels. 
So NeoPixel is the Adafruit term. So Adafruit, fantastic company based out of New York. Uh, if you hear them referred to as NeoPixels, that's Adafruit's kind of, I wouldn't say proprietary one, but that's kind of their brand name uh, for it. And they do a whole lot of different Neop NeoPixel bits and pieces. Uh, just want to take a moment to mention some things from the from the chat. Uh, Kia ora, Lord Otis. Um, greetings to you out in New Zealand. Fun fact, I lived there for almost two years. Until until I started working for uh, for Microsoft, um, and Lord Otis, I I love how you describe me as the 2021 Albert Einstein. <laughs> it's pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. It is for those who watch the UK Top Gear or Grand Tour. My wife reckoned I look like James May in this week, so you know I'm going to go with the Albert Einstein because that feels a lot better. <laughs> awesome, awesome, cool. Oh, some... Sorry, Sam. So, sorry, one thing to call it, um, with the LED strip we recommended is five meters long, which is a lot to put in a pumpkin. Um, so that thing you mentioned about cutting them, although just make sure you're on cutting through the marked cut points on these. And then if you want, this strip is in, we found one that is waterproof. So you can use it to put it in something wet like a pumpkin and not run into issues. Um, if you cut it, put something on the end so it's still waterproof. Um, I think th those are the things I would call out. But this is this is more than enough LEDs for like a, a lot of pumpkins. It could do your shelf. So <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I had to use one of these exact same strips uh, for my shelf, and I had leftovers. So it's there's a lot in these strips, and you get them in a whole lot of different lengths, kind of depending on what you need. And um, if we can just flip back to my screen for my camera, I'll show you the, the waterproofing. So on the strip here, you'll see it at the start. Ah. Can't. It's always hard navigating with an upside down camera. So it's kind of all taped up here to waterproof the end. And you may be able to make out, it's kind of got a, a rubberized coating on there, kind of like see-through rubber on the outside. And that keeps it waterproof. So everything's kind of encased in this kind of clear plastic. Um, and then, yeah, when you cut it, uh, although there is, you might not be able to make that, you can kind of just about see the connections on the end. Top tip, yeah, hot glue, tape, just something on there just to waterproof that. Uh, just stops anything getting in because pumpkins are wet. And I mean, I. I don't know what the weather's like where you are, Sam, but where I am in the Pacific Northwest, it's raining heavily. So if this was sitting outside, uh, it may get very, very wet from rain as well. Uh, San Francisco. So we, we've had a rain recently, luckily, uh, but usually fairly dry. So we, that, not so much a concern here, but awesome. Yeah. Um, oh, and another concern, I'll say this as well, another concern for those folks who are thinking about putting pumpkins out. These are expensive electronics. Uh, you know, a Raspberry Pi kind of kicks in at all oh, 30. Um, they were, I think, 35 bucks. I know they've had to um, stop selling the lower price ones because of supply constraints. Uh, but you're still looking at, you know, 50, 60 bucks plus of hardware in a pumpkin. So if you're putting this outside your house, just beware. Uh, you know, you, you don't want rain is one thing. Uh, where I live, bears may come and play with your pumpkins or, you know, it's, some nefarious individuals might decide that they want these lights for them themselves. So, uh, you know, just make sure if you do put these outside that you're uh, watching in case of in case of uh, ghosts and ghoulies who could go bump in the night who are going to come along and, uh, and steal your pie. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. Should we do some some Python code? Should we actually look at some code and try and get something working? Yeah, yeah. Let's actually let's actually kind of walk through like how do you, how do you get started with this? Can because I I am not a Python expert, so if you can show me, uh, ho hopefully that'll help. Okay. Ah, assuming the problem with cables is cables weigh lots, and I'm close to the edge of my desk and I keep falling off. So let's try and rearrange things a little bit. There we go. Stay still. Okay. So I'm just gonna zip back to my pi, um, my code. Now I'm coding on a Pi, and there's actually two cool ways to code on your Pi. Let's kill that terminal session. There's two ways you can code on a Pi. And well, there's multiple ways you can solve this. And there's the two particular ways that I like to code on a Pi. The first one, if I zip over here, I'm actually on my Pi. So I'm doing what's called VNC, so a screen share to my actual Pi itself. And I'm running Visual Studio Code on the Pi. So if you're a Pi fan and you like to actually run your code you know, on the Pi, maybe you want to program everything on the Pi. You don't want to have to worry about any other computer, you just literally your Pi, you plug it into a screen, plug in a keyboard, and you can install Visual Studio Code. So apt install code, bang, you get code, your VS code, and you can code directly on the Pi. 
Uh, this is one of my preferred ways of doing it. The other way to do it is if you've got a, what's called a headless Pi. So if you're a Pi, you don't want to plug it into a monitor, you can use Visual Studio Code. And we've got a remote SSH extension that you can then use to remotely connect your Pi. So I can program my Pi either on the Pi or from my Mac remotely to my Pi. The big upside to the remote one is when this is in the pumpkin sitting outside my front door, if I need to change anything, if I need to update my code, I can then remotely connect to my Pi over Wi-Fi and update my code, which is quite a cool feature. So let's actually do it on the Pi one. Let's just do it on the Pi. So the first thing you need for Python is you need some pip packages. So Python is a package manager. So Sam, you're a .NET person. You know NuGet? Pip yes. is the yeah. Python version of NuGet. Same kind of idea. Um, and you install packages, and that brings in other people's code to do things. The particular ones you want for the Pi, for, sorry, sorry for the NeoPixels. Let's try and zoom in a bit more. There we go. So the two you want for the um, for, for the LEDs is the RPI WS218X, and that is a Raspberry Pi package. RPI package is all Raspberry Pi packages, and this is for the, the WS218 one family of LEDs. So the 2812Bs that we're using come under this family. You also want to sort the Adafruit CircuitPython NeoPixel library. And that one is from Adafruit, a fantastic company in New York. And they do a language called CircuitPython, which is a variation of Python designed for microcontrollers. Uh, but you can use their CircuitPython libraries with CPython, the, the full Python, and use their NeoPixel library. And that gives you a nice library for accessing these LEDs, which is pretty cool. So those are the two libraries you want. Don't write this other two, we'll come to those later. But those are the ones you want. And then what you want to do is you want to start coding up your pixels. So let me just grab the code I need. It's good old copy and paste development is how we rock. So the code I want for this one. So the first thing I want to do is actually declare my pixels. So there's a couple of libraries I have to bring in. I have to bring in board and NeoPixel. And the board library is a library for the, the Pi, and the NeoPixel is the library we use for managing pixels. Then I want to think about how many pixels I've got. I normally define this in, in, uh, in a constant. And this is the number of pixels I've got. So this is the number of LEDs. Because the Adafruit NeoPixel library, it's a fantastic library, but it's, it's originally built for the Adafruit NeoPixels. They refer to everything as pixels. So you'll see a lot of code samples, everything's referred to as pixels rather than LEDs. We need to define a brightness as well. So when you set these LEDs, you can set a brightness, so how bright the, the lights are. Now, the amount, of, the amount of brightness there is increases the amount of power draw. So if, you, if you're lighting at full brightness with, so, and you're doing white, which is all the pixels lit to their full power, that's the highest power draw you can get. And if you draw too much power, the, the LEDs just don't work. Now, this is really cool. They don't burn out. They just flicker and turn off. So if you if you have a massive long strip and you're saying, I want them all to be white, uh, so that's uh, putting the highest power, and the brightness is, is set to one, the full level, and it doesn't work, the lights don't turn on, just turn down your brightness. So start on brightness 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and kind of adjust that brightness to make it work. If you don't know how many pixels are on your strip, maybe you, you've cut it and now you're you're lost, uh, is there any disadvantage to having less pixel count than you might have on your strip? Uh, nope, it doesn't. The pixel count awesome. tells it which pixels to access. Um, if you get that number wrong, so if you put a small number, then you'll only light that first set, the, that set that you light. So if I put down a pixel, if I have a pixel count of six, but I've actually got eight pixels on my strip, I'm only accessing pixels one to six. I just don't access the later ones. If I have six on there, but I have a string, and I, but I, in my code I say it's a pixel kind of like eight or 10, then um, it, nothing, just nothing will happen. I'll send a signal to the eight, to the eight, nine, 10, the pixels don't exist, so nothing happens. So there is, nothing will break. It's just obviously you may not get what you expect if you're trying to light pixels on the end that don't exist. Awesome, thanks. Cool, and oh, VNC, oh, there we go. VNC got a bit slow. Uh, so this, and then, I, then what I do is actually declare the pixels. So I create a neopixel.neopixel. So that's the class for managing the pixels. I then says board D18. And this is the pin that it's connected to. Uh, 
pin 18, which is the sixth pin along on the outside. This is the pin that the NeoPixels use. And then give it the number of pixels. I could put this in line, but I just like to put it at top. So if I'm adding extra on, I can adjust it easily. And then tell it the brightness that I want. And then finally, there's this auto write parameter. Now the auto write parameter is, um, it allows you to set the colors of the pixels without the pixels changing. And then in one line say, apply. So it's kind of like if you've done databases where you can make inserts and updates and then nothing happens till you commit, this is like the commit. So this means if I'm doing complex logic to work out the different colors of the pixels, I can work out, do all the, all the coloring first and then later on say commit and the whole thing lights up. So that's going to rather than it just happening every time I, I affect a pixel. Uh, so that's how I define my pixels. And then let's, let's set the color of the first pixel. We'll just do one for now. And the way you act, these pixels are based in array. So I access the pixel by the by number, and so pixel zero, and then I pass it a tuple, three values, red, green, blue. In this case, this is kind of a Halloween-y orange. That will set up the pixel. That won't actually do anything because the pixel is not, uh, it, it hasn't been committed. So I need to actually finally, uh, I need to, we'll show. And that will then show the pixel. So if I just save this, if I just turn on auto save, top tip for you, Visual Studio Code is an auto save. This is great. It means it just saves your code as soon as you change it. Never worry about building things and not saving your code. Uh, so now I if I bring up the terminal. <laughs> sorry? I, sorry, I didn't, I didn't know that. That's so cool. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, That's it's cool. kind of hidden. File auto save. You're, I've never been in a situation where I did not want auto save turned on. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know why you why you wouldn't. Uh, that's cool. Okay, I'll have to I'll have to turn that on later. There you Sorry. go. <laughs> go for it. Cool. And then I just need to run these. Now, with these, because of the hardware you're accessing, you have to do it through sudo. So you have to run it as you know, with sudo privilege. So if I go sudo python3 uh, app.py, then you'll notice if I zip to my camera, we have the first LED lit up in orange. Just that one. Nothing else is lit up because I've just said do the first one. Um, because it's so because it's an array, that's just zero. It's the first one. Now, if I wanted to do all the pixels, if I wanted to do the whole lot, then what I could do is I could put pixels dot fill. And then pixels dot fill, that says fill all the pixels with this value. The reason the double brackets is the value that, that's being passed in to fill is this tuple and the brackets defines the tuple. So if I do that, run that again, my camera, you'll see the whole strip is lit up orange. Now what's cool about this, you notice my, my program stopped. The code's run, but yet it's still orange. And that's um, because the light's been told to be orange and they stay that way. So you don't have to worry about um, you know, when your program ends, the lights going off, they stay on. The downside to that is if you do want the lights to go off and the program ends, you have to explicitly turn them off. And the way you turn them off is by filling them with zero. So if I go here and say fill zero, 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 do that, lights are off. So those three values, it's inside each pixel is actually three LEDs, a red, a green, and a blue. And then when you, when you specify those three values, that's how how much how bright the red, the green, the blue LED is, and that kind of sets the color. Now, if you want to get different colors, here's a little cool tip. If you actually go onto uh, onto Google and you search for color picker, it actually brings you up a color picker in the results, which is pretty cool. And so you kind of choose the color you want, and you get the RGB values there. So that's how I do pixels in in Python. Um, we'll take one quick question actually from Lord Otis. How can we count the pixel LED on the strip from SSH? I do not know a way to do the actual count. I do not know a way. There may be something in the NeoPixel library. I've not seen anything. Um, we can have a look, see if there is anything. Um, no, because this one have to set up the number of pins. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Have, I mean, the way I do it is by just counting the LEDs. You know. Doing it, doing it old school. One thing uh, you do get um, 
is a lot of these strips will have a number for how many per meter you'll receive on the LED strip. So I think the one we recommended is 18 per meter. Um, NeoPixels go up to, I think, 144 per meter. Um, but you can use that as a as a way to get a pretty good estimate or exact number of how how many are at that specific point. Uh, it's just just look at how how long is the strip. If it's five meters and there's 18, there's 90 90 pixels. Uh, and so you can just kind of do that math to to work it out. Cool. Yes. Good point. <laughs> if you don't have it there, so as long as you've got, got measuring tape to hand, you you can you can work it out. That's cool. Um, so yeah, so Sam, how, how would I do the same in, in .NET? Uh, it's a little bit, little bit more complicated. Um, uh, so let me just create a new project. Um, so .NET uh, uses the .NET IoT libraries for this, and I, I mentioned we use SPI. So there's a, there's a bit going on here to make this all work. Let's just create one from scratch. Uh, might do a little bit of copy and pasting just to keep us a little bit on time. Um, but if we do .NET new console app, uh, we'll just call this our demo. Sure. Um, so like I said, uh, this, this is just .NET running on a Raspberry Pi. I'm developing locally on my machine. And then we're going to just publish a binary for Linux ARM to uh, wherever it is. Uh, the cool thing with this is you don't need sudo or permissions to run it. And you're just distributing a binary. So you can literally just build this once and then put it on as many pies as you want, and it will just keep running. Or you can give it to your friends and, and do whatever you want. Um, so this is the default we get. We're going to start by deleting all of this. <laughs> uh, so there's a cool new kind of feature called top level functions. You don't need all of that. You get pretty much a Python, Python style thing here. Uh, and so we can just write this. Uh, we need two things to kind of make this whole thing work. So I'm going to go into my demo project and just do a .NET add package. Uh, we're going to add the IoT device bindings. Uh, device bindings. There we go. And that finishes .NET add package of uh, the system device GPIO. All right, there's a pumpkin where I normally put my hand, so I'm typing really weird. Um, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of weird. I uh, don't normally have a pumpkin on my desk, uh, but there we go. Uh, so that restores those two projects. We have these two updated here, so you'll see these two packages get added to your thing. Um, similar to your pip, um, I think it's references.txt, some some packages.txt that pip uses to requirements. That's the thing. Requirements.txt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, so you get that. And then all of our code is just going to live in this program file. We don't need any other stuff to do any of this. Um, we're just going to write a program. Um, this is just .NET code. If you're unfamiliar with top-level functions, this is our main method. Um, we just don't have a class, and we don't have a main. Uh, it's just all generated for this, and it gets added to the global namespace. Um, so so we're like, um, a Python script just kind of runs the script from top to bottom kind of thing. Yes. Uh, so if you try to define a main elsewhere in your code and you're doing something like this, it will, it will error out. Um, it, or it will, it will give you a warning, rather, and we'll ignore that main method. Um, this takes precedent. Um, I think that's the word. Uh, anyway, uh, so this this sort of creates it. This gives us uh, hello world, just to run that. Run. Sure. Uh, we'll get hello world eventually once this builds. I don't know. Uh, probably packages stuff. Anyway, hello world. It works. Uh, nice. Cool. I didn't break it. Um, so we're going to import a bunch of stuff to do drawing. Uh, Python used arrays. The .NET version uses bitmaps. So the actual NeoPixels are an image. And you edit the pixels in that image to actually work with it. Um, so just like you would do any other image manipulation stuff, uh, thinking about that, you could probably actually use image manipulation libraries on some of this to like introduce blurs and cool things. Uh, I might need to give that a shot. <laughs> I guess as well, if you built um, pixels into like an actual rectangular shape or square shape, you could use that to draw an image on it. Right. And so you can get different pixels and different things. Um, but yeah, it's just a 2D uh, array effectively. It's just called a bitmap. Mm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if there's any actual practical difference to it, um, but it makes it nicer because then anything that accepts a bitmap will accept uh, any of the uh, pixel stuff. I'm sort of just going to define our LED count. Let's just say starting, just so we know something's happening. Uh, 
And I have 144 pixels. I'm using a one meter NeoPixel thing inside of mine, uh, just because that's what I had. And then this is the annoying part. Um, so we're using SPI, so we needed to find how we're connecting to SPI. Um, so this is SPI bus one, I, or bus zero, sorry, I believe, which again is that port 10. Um, it's a convenient GPIO port because it's actually 10 uh, pins down on the Pi. Um, nice. But this this defines how it's connected and what frequency it's connected at. Um, so and also like the Python version where the pin 18 is not 18 pins along, it's kind of six along. Right, the GPIO ports are all, are all over and that was like the one that actually is like right where you expect it to be. Um, so it works really well. Um, I have seen this clock frequency written like this uh, with underscores. Um, it's the same thing. This is just a .NET 8 feature, or C Sharp 8, rather, um, feature that lets you kind of do this. Uh, it's 2,400,000. Um, so if that's a lot of zeros, uh, you can put underscores there, and it makes it a little bit easier to read. Um, I just am in the habit of not doing that, so we're, we're not going to do that. Uh, and then the next thing we need is our SPI device. Um, so this is actually what's going to connect. So we do uh, SPI device dot create uh, with our connection settings. That. And then let's actually do our creation of our WS 2812B uh, device. This is the NeoPixel, the LED strip that we're using. Uh, and so we create this SPI device uh, what that's doing behind the scenes is actually figuring out what operating system you're on. This library supports both Windows and uh, Linux platforms, but the way you uh, interact with them is different. So uh, this SPI device that create is actually figuring out what operating system is cur this cur code currently running on and selects for that. So this should create us a Unix SPI device that has all of these connection settings and is able to actually communicate. And then from here, we pass in the LED count, and that creates our bitmap for us. Um, so this device now should have a bitmap defined. So we have just an image that we can grab here, device.image. And that is everything that we need to actually start working with this. If we want to actually set all the pixels to some specific color, let's do a four. Uh, actually, type this correctly. There we go. Uh, less than the LED count and just increment i. And then we can just set our image. So again, this is not like uh, setting, setting an array. There's actually a function for this called set pixel. Nice. Uh, so if you do set pixel, and then we just need to give the x and y coordinate. So we were talking about uh, potentially having like a 2D matrix of LEDs. This supports that. So we actually do need the two coordinates for this. Um, so we're just going to give it i, which is our x index, that's the, the one we want. And then 0 is the y index, so just the, the default. Um, and then we just want to set it to some color. So let's do blue. Uh, okay. My autocomplete is not uh, cooperating. And then just like uh, Jim did, where you have to do, I think it was device.show or leds.show, uh, we have to also trigger this update, because we've kind of staged all of this stuff. We need to actually show this. Uh, so we can do just image dot, or device rather device dot show show this. Uh, the other thing I forgot because I missed it is we can also do a clear. Um, this is the same thing. This actually overwrites all the pixels in the strip to whatever color you provide. The default is black, so it will turn everything off. We could also instead of having written this for loop, we could have just done color dot blue here. Uh, and ignore the fact that it keeps completing to console color because fun. Um, but it, this is the same thing as as this for loop. Uh, it's it they just do the same thing. So if you want to reset your state each time, uh, that clear is a good thing to start with. Just clear with no parameters. We'll set it back to black, and you're good to just kind of update things again. Uh, and that that's that's it. Um, once we've done this, we actually need to compile it. This is the uh, annoying part, I guess, of doing this with C sharp. Uh, it actually requires a little bit of compiling and doing things because you actually need to compile the code rather than Python, which can just be interpreted on your machine. Uh, there's things on my arm in there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the way this works, we need to publish this. Uh, so .NET 
publish is the command for that. And we can provide a runtime that we actually want to publish this for. If I publish this for my machine, it's a x86, just Windows machine. Uh, that's not going to work on a Pi. Uh, so we actually need to specify where this code is going to be running so that the, the uh, binary we create is actually compatible with that system. Um, so we're going to say Linux ARM. And that will not Oh, uh, dot not is not a <laughs> thing. <laughs> there we go. Right, that was a little confusing, but uh, uh oh. Does not contain a definition for image. Uh, I think I meant to capitalize that. There we go. Uh, show. It should update. <laughs> okay, weird. Uh, type in random things. I think show is your thing. Anyway. Yes, show is my thing. <laughs> I'm okay. Well, right, right. The libraries are not the same. Uh, different things, different, different stuff. Uh, but this actually creates something you can see. We get a fun binary here. And then this is all running on my local machine. If you want to actually develop .NET on the Pi, you can do that. You Then you wouldn't need this publish. You could just do .NET run, and it would work. Um, but I'm not doing that. Um, so I actually need to copy that over. And for that, I just use STP, uh, which is a secure copy. Uh, and that is actually just going to copy it over. Um, when you set up your Pi, you can give it a address. Uh, and so that's what I've done here. It's called the jackopi.local. Um, and we can just upload our thing there. Let's put it in LED, which is where all the other projects go. And this just uploads our demo project into that directory. Uh, cool. There are, what? what? I was just going to say, Sorry. while that's uploading, um, I just want to sh show everyone a quick top tip about how you can set up all the SSH and all that that uh, the Sam is showing. So if you have, if you just check out my screen, uh, this is the Raspberry Pi imager. So this is the tool from Raspberry Pi for actually imaging the uh, SD cards uh, that you'll be using. Now, when you when you do this, you can kind of choose your Raspberry Pi operating system. So you can say you want you know, Raspberry Pi Lite or full Raspberry Pi, whatever, and you can choose the SD card. But what you can also do, and this is the magic trick. If I do Control Shift X, it's not visible anywhere. There's no option for this. You have to know the magic key combination. Control Shift X. This allows you to go and actually configure your Pi. So you can enable SSH, give it the name that you need, um, configure your Wi-Fi and all that. So by doing this, this is how you can set it up on your Pi uh, at image flashing time so that you can then SCP onto your Pi. So top tip, Control Shift X in the Raspberry Pi Major to allow you to do all this kind of setup. It also lets you configure your password and set up a host name, which is that Jacko Pi that I'm using to actually SSH into. Instead of an IP address, a host name actually gives you a way to figure out where your thing is. Um, it should be unique, uh, but if you give it something memorable, then you can just enter that into whatever program you're using, and you'll find it on your network. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty nice way to, to figure out where everything is. Uh, so. Oh, yes. Yeah, I love this. You set the host name, enable SSH, set the password, and then you can do your wi um, configure your Wi-Fi and all that kind of stuff um, in there. So it's, it's really cool options. Right. Uh, so I've actually finished the upload, so we can now SSH in. Uh, so I do pi at echo pi uh, local. And this connects to the Raspberry Pi, and we have a LED folder. There's actually a few different demos here um, because I've just been uploading all of them here. Uh, so this is a mess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we should wow. see a demo inside of Publish. Um, so we have a Publish directory. Inside of that, we should have demo. If I just run demo, uh, we're going to get permission denied because uh, we just copied it over. We didn't set the... Uh, execute permission. So you just do ch mod plus x uh, with demo. That's actually going to make it executable. And then we should be able to just run demo. And now my pumpkin is blue. <laughs> uh, and so that that's, that's that. Um, there are some config options you need to do. I mentioned we were using SPI. Uh, on your Raspberry Pi's SD card, there's a config.txt. Um, you do need to set that. Uh, let me. I didn't really plan this through, but we're just going to unplug that. And if I have fingernails, I don't. <laughs> yeah, that can be a bit know. fiddly getting the SD cards out of these things. I agree. Um, 
There we go. Cool. And then Windows complains about formatting. It should be fine. Um, not accessible. Cool. Ansel. There. Okay. <laughs> Whatever that is, uh, we can ignore it. Uh, and we end up with this. This is your config that uh, determines a bunch of things about your Pi. There are three settings you need to actually change. Um, you'll see there's a bunch of DT param things that define different things about your Pi. Uh, you need to turn SPI on. If you have this off, you're going to get an error um, that is saying that, that SPI is not enabled, that you need to enable it, uh, something. I believe it, it will give you a little bit of help there, um, but these are the settings you need. And then you also need to configure the core frequency, um, NeoPixels and uh, these type of lights expect a specific frequency of communication. And so this kind of clocks it uh, so that the, the speed doesn't constantly shift and cause weird behavior. Uh, and that should be it. So just to add, that's just for the .NET libraries, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So I, I, did, uh, I did none of that. When I'm doing it on the Python side using the, the Adafruit NeoPix libraries, I did none of that. Um, just a, a different library under the hood access things a different way. Right. So the, both of these work very differently, but they both get you the same results. Um, so it's really whichever one you prefer to work with. If you if you have a bunch of like .NET libraries and things that you want to use, or maybe you have some some shared library or something that you're, you're working on, uh, this could work, or even ASP.NET probably would work here. You could host an ASP.NET website and actually uh, send requests to change the color that way. Um, that that should all work. Um, but if you just need Python, uh, I think Jim's code is much shorter than mine, um, and the the NeoPixel libraries are great. So kind of kind of choose choose whichever you like. Yeah. Uh, just we'll take a moment for a couple of things from the the chat. Um, Peter M. Hello, hello, welcome. Glad to hear you're taking the IT for beginners. Um, that's a very cool course. So yeah, Peter says, Peter from New York, also taking Jim Bennett's IT for beginners course. So uh, yeah, glad you're taking that course. It was a, a lot of fun building that, so I hope you enjoy that. Uh, Peter also has a great tip um, to protect your wires. He says you can get heat shrink tube from a hardware supply store. So this is kind of plastic tubing. You put it on, like wave a hairdryer over it and it shrinks. Um, so that's a good way to actually um, to kind of heat it. So if I actually go back to my camera, um, it's, it's kind of got that. So this here, you'll notice this kind of here is, uh, if I can get the place, this kind of white stuff here, it's kind of like that. So you put it on there and it just, when you when you heat it up, it shrinks and kind of sucks in. So that's a great way to do um, to do waterproofing. So yeah, great shout out. Thanks, Peter. I also want to say that we've, we have just put in the chat a link to something all about the serial peripheral interface. So if you want to learn more about SPI, uh, we've got a link in the chat there that can uh, dives actually into the depths of what SPI actually is. So uh, if you're interested, that's there for you to, to dive in more. I need to take that class because I, I, I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> it's something that I've been learning just for this demo and, and sort, of, sort of picking up on the go. So uh, might need to might need to spend some time on that this afternoon. Yeah, it's so I know it's a bit of a long link. Um, so github.com slash Microsoft slash IT for beginners is our 24 lesson IoT course. Um, and it's in one of the lessons there. We actually go into SPI and a few of the other interfaces on the board. So uh, it's, it's it's one to check out. And I don't just say that because I wrote it. It is one to check out. Um, I would also give a send about GitHub content. I will also say this. Everything that we've shown today and a whole lot more, and we'll, we've still got more time to dive into stuff, is on GitHub. So... If you go to uh, aka.ms slash tech or treat code, uh, you will get taken to this lovely GitHub repo that we've got. And in here, we have got a whole lot of stuff. So all the parts list we talked about today, how to just set everything up, stuff on the LEDs, uh, how to do wiring on for Python and .NET, uh, the Grove sensors for the, the distance sensor, which we'll talk about in a second. And... A whole lot of samples, so light, or different light ups, all the internet control, whole lot of bits and pieces, .NET samples. It's all here in this one GitHub repo. So yeah, you, know, you don't have to kind of re keep rewinding the video and type out everything that uh, that Sam's typing out or everything that I'm typing out. We've got it all here in this GitHub repo for you. So you know, if you just watch this video for inspiration and you want to spend this weekend hacking, you know, maybe your kids have got a Raspberry Pi and they're interested in lighting up a pumpkin, just come to this repo and grab everything and get going with it. So top tip, we wrote the code so you don't have to. 
Awesome. Uh, do we have? I think we have about ten minutes for just demoing all sorts of cool things. Because I know I know you've done some things with distance sensors. I I've done some work with weird image library things. Um, so should we just kind of walk through some of the the more advanced things and kind of show people how how they can take this a little bit further and and kind of expand on this project after just turning an LED on? Yeah. Yeah, so let me show off a couple of couple of fun bits. Um, I won't dive too deep in the code. Just do this to kind of show you what you can do with all the codes in the GitHub repo. Um, but first thing I'm going to do is is audio. Show off show off sound. So let me just spin up the. Um... My IoT demo. So I'll spin up this one just to show, just to remember the sound. So when I press a button, it makes noises. Welcome to our fun house. <laughs> That's me at my most spooky. <laughs> I'm not sure it's that spooky. Uh, but Python's got some great audio libraries. So there is a library called PyAudio, which is it's in my requirements or TXT, PyAudio. This is a library for managing audio files, as the name suggests. And then what I'm doing is I've got a, a spooky audio file. So I've just recorded a .wav file. And... This, yeah, I just recorded this using a, just a microphone, just recorded me making sound, but any kind of audio file you want. Uh, ideally, you want a WAV file. Um, MP3 files need a decoder library. So you want a, a full WAV file that's the full uncompressed audio. And what you do is just open this WAV file and then you just dump it out to a stream. So you just use Pi Audio, open the file. You can read the, all the file size, like the sample width and the number of channels, whether it's mono, stereo, all that kind of stuff from it, and then spit that out to audio. So that gives you a spooky sound. So if you want to actually make it make noises, you can do that. Now, obviously, when you make it, when you to trigger the noise, you don't want that going all the time. There's a couple of different ways to do it. So the first one I've set up is the one I just showed. This is Azure IoT Central. This is an IoT software as a service application. So I can use this to control IoT devices. And this is completely free for one or two devices. So I can spin this up, won't cost me a penny, runs in the cloud. I've got well, only one, got one device on here. And I set up what's called commands. And these are messages that are sent to the device. And then on my device, what I do is I've got some connection details. Um, yes, I'm giving away secrets, but it's OK. I'm going to rotate these as soon as the stream is over. So you can't steal my pie. Um, but so I've got, it's got some connection details and then Pardon me, there's a different my code. I then connect to IT Central. I build up this device client that connects to IT Central and is listening. Uh, once it's connected, I then have, I then say, well, every time a command is received, call a function. And then in my function, I can get the name of the command that comes in. So I've got a command called scare, light, and flames, and they do different things. And if I get the scare command, it plays the, the audio. If I get the light command, it sets the light based off the value I send. Or if I do the flames command, I get a kind of a flame flame effect going. So this is kind of the flame effect going here. That kind of happens by default. But if I go here and set a color, like this pink color, see so it goes pink. Uh, or I can go back to flames. All controlled through IT Central. Now this means the moment I have to go to this website, the IT Central application to press all these buttons and do things, but I can get REST APIs for these. So if I want to get this to a stream deck or uh, a, some kind of internet button, I could get REST APIs for these. I could put a website for it, anything I wanted to do, and then control these over the internet from something else. So that's pretty cool. So it's all in the GitHub repo. Uh, all the code for doing this, all the instructions for getting set up is all in the GitHub repo. So that's a couple of cool things uh, you can do. Sam, show me your, your image thing. I, I love this. I want, I want to hear more about, about the image thing. Yeah. So uh, this is actually like a r relatively new thing that I've been uh, playing with. I had this idea yesterday in, in a meeting with Jim, and it turned out really cool. Um, so what this is, um, we can switch the screen over to my, there we go. Um, so my code, uh, the code samples I have are a little bit uh, more complicated than the initial demo I showed. I'm using environment variables to actually pull in the LED count and a few other things, um, just so that you can reconfigure this. I uh, mentioned like having one binary and kind of shipping it to different pies. Those, LED, or those environment variables give you a way to do that. Um, so in this case, we're actually grabbing an image path environment variable from anywhere. Um, and so we can, we can, uh, we're using a web client here to just kind of download or find a local file to any image. And then what it does, uh, if I actually pull up my image, cause it's, it's a work of art. <laughs> um, um, so what this is, 
is each of the horizontal lines, each of these uh, sets of pixels is just the state of my LEDs. Um, it doesn't have to match exactly the number of LEDs you have. It will figure it out. It just kind of translates from LED space. So if I have 144 pixels, it rounds that down between to a number between 0 and 1 for where the pixel is in that strip, and then expands it back out to get the number of pixels in the image. Um, so I think this is 200 pixels wide. Um, so it goes down to, like, if we have 0.5, it goes from... Uh, so pixel like 72, I hope my math is right, um, goes from 72 to 0.5 and then increases that back up to 100. So we look up pixel 100, which is about red. Um, and this allows us to kind of define, in this case, I have 600 frames of animation that we can just run through. And this is just a quick image that I drew. Um, and you can just modify this as you want. Uh, but... You can also just point this at a website and be like, this is a cool image. Here's a picture of flames. And it will download that image before starting and then just run through that image and cycle through it. Um, so that's sort of what this is. I'm using Luna Paint here to kind of do all of this. And we can just add some fun extra things. So this was just flame, because <laughs> why not? Uh, again, the, the cool thing with the slanted lines, basically, is that's an animation, a translation left or right along the strip. Uh, so as it moves down, it will either move further to the right or further to the left of the strip. And so if you do little squiggles, you kind of get a, a pixel that traces a little squiggle for you. Um, and it just kind of works. Uh, and you can you can kind of do whatever you want. Uh, if we want to add some blue in, because why not? Uh, we can we can do that. <laughs> um, and you're I'm not an artist. Inside Visual Studio Code. Yeah, yeah. So this is Luna Paint. Um, so you can just open any PNG. This is actually on my Pi. So I actually am in a remote session to uh, my Raspberry Pi, actually just running this and, and changing, ch changing things, uh, ad adding to the image, and apparently inserting a lot of purple. Um, so we can do that. You probably don't want like curls, because that doesn't actually translate well. <laughs> and so then from there, we can just connect. Uh, and I think I'm already connected, so I should just be able to open up a terminal. I didn't try this, so this might explode. Um, if you don't have auto auto save turned on, I don't know. Oh, good good call. Oh no, there we go. Cool export. Um, and then we have an LED count, which is the number of LEDs I have, 144, and export an image path, which is a relative path to wherever the image is. So it should be image slash fire. There we go. And then I just need to run my published um, image scan. And if this all works. We now have like weird blinky purple things in there as well as all the other colors just kind of dancing around. Um, so cool. Yeah, and it, it works for it works for anything. This is it's just a web client, so it'll go and pull pull down an image. If you have some image that is constantly updated, like a daily image or something, um, this will get that new image every time and pull that down, and you can do that. Um, but yeah, you can just edit this. And since this is all in the Pi, I can edit this and then just restart the application, and it will pick up the new updates and we'll get whatever and, and you can it, we're literally just drawing led paths here so it's it's super cool that's brilliant that's absolutely brilliant and we've got the code sample for that in github haven't we so if anyone else wants to do this they can recreate this yes and the code is not that not that complicated it's literally like everything's just a bitmap right so yeah we're, we're, we're literally just giving it a path and saying open that path and read that path in and then just do some translation math is a little Weird. Uh, that function's not even used. Um, <laughs> but here, here we're we're literally just uh, doing some some of the translation to actually get us into this, to into the right uh, unit space, and then we're we're good to go. Um, nice. Yeah. Nice. And um, one thing I will say is we've built the set, set these core demos doing this GitHub repo, but we'd love to see what you do. So if if you're out there, you're looking at the stuff we're doing, going, that's cool. I want to get going with my pumpkin, and I want to build something else. If you've got a cool demo please, please raise a pull request against the GitHub repo. Uh, you know, share it with us and we'll share it with the world because there's so many cool things you can do. I mean, we just threw together a few of these demos in a short space of time and there's probably a million different ideas that you've got uh, that could really make this better. So shout out to the audience. Please, please, please submit your pull requests, submit your ideas. Um, yeah, we would love to make this a fantastic, um, fantastic repo. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you, you mentioned Grove has some cool... Um, libraries available. 
the .NET IoT is not just lights. Um, it's all all those same devices that that uh, Python supports uh, work here, and they they just do .NET things. So if you want, if that's something you want, uh, you you can stick distance detectors or a compass, so you can have a, your pumpkin point north or something. Um, that would actually be cool if you had it connected to your GPS, and then you could like walk around, and it showed the way to walk. Uh, anyway, <laughs> well, you could you could tell that with Azure Maps for routing and actually get directions to people's houses, so it can kind of guide you to someone's house, your friend's house, or to a good place for trick or treating. Right. Uh, so so we might we might expand on this next year. Um, mm. <laughs> if if there's interest, you have to let us know because other, otherwise, who knows? Uh, yeah. I think I think that's everything that we had, right? Uh, you called out the plastic bag. Make sure to protect your electronics. Uh, yeah. Their their electronics. Um, yeah, also, uh, yeah, just just make sure that they're it's in a, a secure place so that it doesn't your your stuff doesn't disappear. Um, and I think that's mostly it. Just go and have fun. Uh, that yeah. was really really the purpose here is just to get you all super excited about this because this stuff is cool. Yeah, you've got the rest of the day and tomorrow, depending where you are in the world, before Halloween. So yeah, get playing. See what come up with. And share it with us. Um, we've been if you use the hashtag tech or treat on social, we're gonna monitor that and we'd love to see what you've done. So if you want to share pictures, videos, use the hashtag tech or treat so we can check it out. Um, and we'll share that with the world. But no, it's so much you can do with this. So please have fun and tell us what you've been making. Absolutely. Awesome. If there's any, no other questions, I think we're good. Um, there but, is oh. one, so just one quick question in the chat I don't want to answer from Peter saying, I attended a Microsoft IoT bootcamp in December 2017. Some of the code ran on a Pi with Windows 10. Is Windows 10 on Pi still maintained? Um, I don't believe so. I don't know what the official position on it is, um, but certainly we haven't seen the updates to Windows 10 IoT core, and I don't believe it runs on the latest Pis. So um, yeah, I haven't seen like a Raspberry Pi 4 version of it. So I don't know what the future is for Windows 10 IoT Core uh, on Raspberry Pis, um, but certainly, yeah, it's not supported on the later Pi versions. So. I I have not used it, uh, so I can't I can't say. But cool. I've only got one I'm, pie I'm glad you knew because I, I looked at that and I was like, oh no, I don't know. <laughs> I've only got one Pi that's old enough to run it. It does not support on the later ones, unfortunately. So. Right, and we were we were both using I think Pi fours. Um, there's no reason that this code shouldn't work on a Pi 3. If you if you just have a spare Pi 3 from some previous hack lying around, you can pull it apart for, for this, this weekend and, and build something with that and, and even, then put it back. Even a Pi Zero. Uh, so the, the $5 Pi Zero, as long as you don't mind the, not having Wi-Fi and you're happy to edit the code directly on the Pi, the $5 Pi Zero can power the NeoPixels, um, the LED strips, or the $10 Zero W, or the $15 Zero 2W, you know, the, the, the cheaper Pi... Pies will still support all this. So if it's the $10 or $15 Wi-Fi Pi Zeros, you better do everything you've got with internet control, kind of whatever. Um, but yeah, so if you've got like, you know, it's like these tiny little Pi Zeros, you can use these. Top tip, if you're getting a Pi Zero, you can get some of the headers pre-soldered, so you don't have to do it. If you're like me and you can't solder for Toffee, you don't have to worry about soldering headers on to connect the, uh, the cables, so. And this these, LED strips also work with like Arduinos and things like that as well. So mm -hmm. um, if, if you if you want to do .NET, .NET Arduino, I believe I mm -hmm. need to double check. Uh, but but there, there's there's all sorts of cool cool ways to integrate microprocessors and things into pumpkins because why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, so for, for .NET, there's the .NET Nano framework, I think it is, um, that has all the support and uh, or Meadow. So Meadow is a Meadow. Network, that's .NET. one. Yeah. Um, or if you're interested for, for Python, yeah, the library I'm using is the CircuitPython NeoPixel library. CircuitPython is a microcontroller version of Python from Adafruit. So if you're running devices like, I don't know, Circuit Playground Express, like this one here, uh, you can control all these with CircuitPython. So you can use it on microcontrollers. Um, but there's also, if you don't want to use LED strips, there's a whole world of different lights. I mean, this is the Circuit Playground Express from Adafruit, and it's got lights in a circle. And you can code this with block-based coding or CircuitPython. If you want to use a Pi, then um, Pimeroni in the UK, they do uh, the blinked strips. That's a strip of LEDs that just fits straight on the GPIO pins. They've got a unicorn hat with more LEDs that just fits on the GPIO pins. So if anyone want to do wiring, you could just get a strip like this. A um, bit more... Uh, more expensive than the LEDs, less flexible in terms of where you can put them because they're just stuck on the top. But again, it's just an array of 
pixels you can light up. So there's lots of different lighting options if you want. There's so many different th ways you can do, you can kind of build these cool pumpkins. Awesome, cool. Yeah, I think the only other thing I'd call it is you can actually just like put your phone in a bag and that will work too. Just put a video on, put it on loop and, and your phone can play a video through like the mouth or eye or something and, and just work that way. If you don't, don't have these components yet and I know so, like the pies are a little bit hard to get right now. Um, so if you want to do something this weekend, that can be a, a really quick option and you can kind of build from there and, and just kind of explore adding cool tech stuff to, to, to random craft projects because that's the fun part of all of this. Oh, uh, yeah. Just top tip, though, if you're going to do that with a, with a phone, don't leave it sitting on your doorstep. Um, definitely. Definitely. You know, unless you're in a, a, somewhere very, very safe. You don't want somebody reaching in and stealing your, your phone. So, uh, you yeah, know, just definitely more of a, a window, a windowsill. Uh, pumpkin than a outdoor on your on your porch thing uh, <laughs> yes and but, again if your phone is not uh, waterproof or you just don't want to get it get it covered in pumpkin goo then you probably want to put it inside a bag right yeah. oh oh well peter m still has his nokia windows 8 phone so uh you know that's probably one that's unlikely to be stolen from someone's doorstep um, I have like eight of those lying around. I was actually going to put together a demo for this and ran out of time. Um, but I, I have like eight old Windows phones that are perfect for this because like the the 650, like the Nokia 650s were, were even cheap at that time. And they're, they're perfect for this because they're tiny. Um, they hold their charge for a long time and you can just kind of show a bunch of cool things. So yeah, I, there, there's a lot you can do here. We're, we're kind of just trying to get you inspired and make you think like... Oh, we can do this and show you that it's not as hard as it might seem if you're coming at it completely from nothing. So um, we're uh, running a bit over time. So if there's no other questions, maybe we can start wrapping this up. But we're, I'm happy to answer questions. Or if there's you start trying to implement this, you can call us both out on Twitter or something, and we'll we'll try to get you <laughs> figure it out with you. So. Yeah, I think that's all the questions, apart from Peter saying that, uh, that he, he thinks the Windows phones are before your time. But I guess if you've got a whole stack of them, they're not. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Well, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Sam. This this was a lot of fun. This is one of the, one of the most fun streams I've ever been on. I never thought I'd ever get a chance to be live on Microsoft looking like this. I know. It's great, right? Our jobs are awesome. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I'm getting paid to look this stupid. It's great. I know, right? Uh, so, yeah, we got, we got to do pumpkins. So Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we will see you uh, whenever we do. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Happy Halloween. Exactly. That's a better sign off. Uh, 